Thank you so much for coming.、Um, I'm Tomoko Steen at Science, Technology, and Business Division. And today's event is co sponsored with、um, Office of Health Services.、Uh, we have been organizing、uh, lectures, health related lectures together with、uh, Dr. Charles and Ms. Riley. Is in the back there. <laughs> and uh, this month uh, is um, men's health. And we thought about what would be a good topic. And this is actually、um, you know, for anybody. It's a health for men and women about the fungi. And、um, so, Dr. Calderon is、uh, really internationally known for the, his study on the、uh, Candida. And he has、uh, actually a textbook on that topic. It's a big, big textbook, isn't it?、Mm -hmm. <laughs> and,、um, So, if you, you know, want to re read more, just to、um, let me know. I'm happy to give you a reference. And just today is、um, just the end of the, this、uh, Men's Health Month uh, closing uh, lecture.、Um, let me introduce、uh, Dr. Calderon.、Uh, Dr. Richard Calderon is the chair of the Department of the Microbiology and immunology at the Georgetown Medical Center. And also, he is a director of the、um, MS program on the、uh, biomedical science policy and advocacy. So, there are、um, students who come from a、um, variety of backgrounds who want to learn about science policy. Before going to medical school or PhD, they often take our、uh, program. It's a one year program. And、um, so he's a director of that program. And、uh, his research、uh, originated the candidates, and that was a focus. But he expanded a lot of more research, and especially the、um, drug targeting、uh, for the Treatment of the、uh, fungus sicknesses. And、uh, now he's looking at the microbiome, skin microbiome. So, microbiome, people think so often gut microbiome. And we、uh, sponsored a lecture on the gut microbiome、uh, cases. But he is now going to talk about the skin microbiome and also the fungus infections. So, Before further ado, please join me、uh, welcoming Dr. Calderon. Tomoko, thank you. Is this the one? This one. Okay. Um, <clears throat> well, thank you for that introduction. It's nice, nice being here.、Um, you mentioned microbiome. We're not going to talk about microbiome. We don't have enough data yet to even. <laughs> but but what's, what's interesting about the subject itself is that, and I, mean, I, I think it points to the importance of teaching also, because you'd be surprised how much you learn by teaching. You don't walk into a classroom with all the information, you've got to go dig it out. It's not up here. And you learn things. And one of the things that I'll talk about today is something that I Initially, learned by giving a lecture and to a master's degree and PhD students. And, and I think that、um, I firmly believe that. And well, I mean, it, it's, it's a way of learning, I think. And teaching is a way of learning. You know, and I think that's a message for all of you that are interested in doing teaching and that are, are teaching. And I'm sure you know what I'm saying. So I'll skip to the Story today. I want to.、Uh, so I've been, I've been in, at Georgetown 45 years. I know I look like, what, 29, 39 years old? I'm not. <laughs> 45 years. And、uh, so, yeah, so interests change and, and all of that.、Uh, doing much more teaching in the, in the department now because it used to be almost strictly a PhD student. Postdocs, but now it's PhD and postdocs, not as many, but more master's degree students. And they're fun to work with. And I've, I've, I see one or two. I thought I saw one. Yes, I see one for sure <laughs> that was in the policy program. So, anyway, okay, enough of that.、Um, so, here's, here's what I want to talk about today. 
And it sounds a little bit odd, maybe according to the title you read in your abstract, but, but I'm going to do these kind of things. But at the end, I wanted to talk about some of the interesting things going on with environmental fungi and environmental microorganisms. So just a brief discussion of that. And then uh, a paper that was released in this year, 2019, a science article on uh, the disappearance of biodiversity among amphibians has nothing to, I don't know anything about amphibians. I mean, oh, well, okay, I know what an amphibian is. But I think the important thing is just this concept of loss of diversity, biodiversity. And it's due to a fungus, and that fungus is something called a chytrid. Um, in actuality, it's so simple compared, the structure is so simple compared to what we normally look at under a microscope for fungal pathogens, that, it, that it, uh, it's a very unique kind of organism. Uh, the classification may be, may be fungus, maybe not fungus, that kind of thing. So it's sort of one of these intermediate. But I thought I would bring it along and, and try to give you an idea of impact of environmental fungi also at the very end. Um, and of course, that's what I do is up above. So here are some introductory comments. Um, I'm sorry, it looks so detailed, but uh, so there's about 150 species of fungi that cause disease, infectious diseases in people. And um, these diseases vary. They could be infections, disease of, of cutaneous tissue, mucosal, um, lung, uh, or bloodborne pathogens that either get inhaled or are part of the normal microbiota of people. Um, they cause a serious number of allergies of various kinds, various kinds of organisms, and they can be global infections uh, or they can be endemic. Some of the uh, really important respiratory disease pathogens are some things you probably never heard of, blastomycosis. Maybe you have histoplasmosis, coccidium mycosis. Those are all diseases that are endemic to the U.S. Um, and parts of, parts of Africa, parts of South America, but really heavily concentrated. Epidemics, they cause epidemics and serious lung infections in a number of people. Uh, if I made you sound, if I made it sound interesting, now I'm going to say I'm not going to talk anymore about that. But nevertheless, that's that's part of the whole thing. Um, antifungals, we we do a lot with that kind of thing, and it's mostly development, searching for new antifungals, uh, and uh, I'll get into why we are doing that. Um, but I sort of summarized it here. Um, there's resistance to the antifungals, just like bacteria. Um, there is something called drug-drug interactions, which I'll get to, and there is even toxicities. You have to understand fungi are more like people than bacteria are like people, right? Where you cut and so are fungi, so what you run into is some toxicity. So if you have a, a drug that kills fungi, you might have toxicity associated with that and people that are receiving that drug. Um, so I won't, I won't say much about immunity also, but there is... Um, Immunity, that's established, very strong immunity. It's usually cell-mediated immunity. There is one vaccine that um, has been developed, um, and it's, it's gone through a lot of preclinical um, experimentation and trials, and, that, and then has moved on to the FDA. I think it's in phase two now. And it's a, a vaccine which is to something called recurrent vulval vaginal candidiasis. And um, so that's, that's one of the, I think, the good products, I think, that's come out of all the basic science that's been funded. Um, I, want to, I want to talk about incidents also, because I think to make your case about the importance of fungal infections, you need to know how much, you need to tell people about how much there is, how much disease is there. So I'm going to show you some of that data. Growth forms, if there's 150 fungi, there's 150 different forms, growth forms, and that's exaggeration. But I think you get the idea that you're dealing with a lot of organisms. Um, and many of them are um, very serious, cause uh, mortality. Uh, many cause mor morbidity. And uh, 
Most of them come from the environment. Uh, things like aspergillus, I'm sure you've heard of aspergillus somewhere along. Yeah, so that's, that's an environmental. The ones I just mentioned, these endemic mycoses, fungal diseases that you see in this country are also uh, aerosols of spores and the environment are inhaled, et cetera, et cetera. Um, Canada, which is what we work with, is the exception. It is part of us. I would say 85% of the people in this room, 85 to 90% are carrying the organism. Most of them, most of you carry it in at gut, the gut or maybe um, uh, commensals of the oral cavity or vaginal mucosa or the skin. Um, it's there and it, it causes infections, mainly in people that have underlying diseases also. And we'll talk about that. Um, okay, so just this is a real rapid look at mycoses means fungal disease, and here they are. They can be chronic, they can be acute diseases, they cause morbidity and or mortality, and there are all the sites of the infections. I put some of those sites, locations of infections in green, and those are the ones that, uh, those are the sites that are infected by Canada, the organism we work with. Um, there are many fungi, environmental, that produce toxic, toxic diseases. Um, and, um, you know, one of the, the most common ones is something called aflatoxin, which is produced by an aspergillus. And it's, it's not peculiar to developing countries. It is in developing countries. It's also in the U.S. And, and it, it caught, it's a billion-dollar industry just to prevent this kind of thing from happening and trying to develop resistance and that kind of thing. And then molds and allergies would be another big area. Okay, incidents. Um, I, th I think the ball got rolling a bit better in terms of interest in, in mycoses, fungal diseases, when people began doing the incidence data. And I have to mention one group. They're called GAFI. And GAFI stands for Global Action Fund for Fungal Infections. What they do, it's a database of incidents um, and how much mortality, how much morbidity, and epidemiology. So they publish that data, but they also provide information on lab diagnostics and, and also treatments. So um, I think the important thing is that this was the initiator of a lot of the incidents. And now it's just, you see, Incidence data coming from all countries, and I'll give you some of that data in just a few minutes. Um, and I guess the underlying thing is there's a lot of fungal disease which is going on. And uh, so let's, let's take, take a look at that. I'm sorry for a small print, but this was a, a paper that was published in Science Translational Medicine in 2012. And what they looked at um, was the 10 most significant invasive fungal infections. So these are uh, people that would be infected by oral um, acquisition, aerosols, and end up in the lung and become invasive and systemic invasion. Or they might be things like candida. There's candida right there, which is part of us, as I said, and infections occur. So these are all what are called opportunistic uh, infections, meaning that there's something else going on in the patient. And that something else could be surgery, it could be stem cell transplant, it could be radiation from chemotherapy, which uh, makes people susceptible to, f to not a number of things, not just fungi, but bacteria also. And so these are distributed everywhere. And uh, what you have are numbers now, estimated life-threatening infections per year at that location. Uh, so aspergillus, about 200,000 cases. Uh, Canada, about 400,000 cases of significant morbidity, mortality, infections. Here's cryptococcus, one million cases per year. And, and uh, we'll talk a little bit about, is that everywhere or is it only in certain parts of the country? We'll get into that. And then um, mucormycosis, less but important, mostly in diabetic patients that uh, are acidotic. In other words, um, not treating their diabetes so well. Uh, pneumocystis is another fungus which is quite quite common. And then, um, so that's that's the first group. And notice that what I've circled here is the morbidity. And and um, the, one of the problems I think in looking at incidence is that 
especially in this type of incidence, is you have to look at uh, studies, data studies, that, that speak to the service the patient is in the hospital. Is the patient in intensive care unit? Is, it in, is the patient in cardiology, uh, dermatology, or whatever? That's a big, big uh, factor that, that determines how much infections there are. And so that's why there's, there's variation, like Canada, 46 to 75 percent. If you were looking at um, children and intensive care units, it would be up around 75 percent. Um, but but uh, other services, not very high. So it, the data has to reflect where the infections are occurring. It also will vary depending upon the hospital. You can go to website and look up, uh, I'm not picking on New York, you understand. But you can go to New York, and they list all the hospitals in the state of New York. And they also list which ones have the highest and which ones have the lowest rates of infection. So you, you have to understand that there's variation even in hospitals. And, of course, globally there's variation. The other large group, uh, the endemic, uh, are things that I mentioned. Mycoses, dimorphic mycoses, blastomycosis, coxy, and hostoplasma. And the numbers are much less. You can see that uh, the first three are found in the U.S. Um, and, and, uh, but, but they do have significant mortality. And these are the three that do cause epidemics. You don't, there are others that cause epidemics, but of all of these, you don't really see epidemics in, in Canada. It can occur, but it's rare. But on the other hand, in histo and coccidium, I could see a lot of it. Okay, so that's, that's a global study. So once, uh, one time I was invited to go to Mexico to give a talk, and I said, I think I'll look up the incidence of fungal infections in Mexico. And so, um, unfortunately, these are all abbreviated. Uh, RVVC is, is, a, is a vaginal infection, and the R stands for the fact that it's a recurrent disease. So the woman infected, um, there's a chance that um, she will have four infections per year, perhaps, and that qualifies uh, categorization as recurrent vulvovaginal candidiasis. So here's the burden, and it's two million so-and-so cases, and the rate, usually, usually incidence data is explained as the rate per 100,000 people, and, and so there it is, uh, quite high. Mortality, not much, and this is an aspergillus infection. This is another aspergillus infection, um, and that incidence is, is fairly high. Uh, fungal keratitis, eye infections, um, there it is. Invasive candidiasis, 8.6 rate, the rate, mortality, as I mentioned. Um, and serious fungal infections, which is what they, um, they classify in Mexico. Everything else except what, what I've mentioned, they put in a category called serious fungal infections, whereas Cryptococcus and coccidiomycosis are serious infections too, but this is like other things, and you can see it's quite. And here is coxy, and I just told you it was it was in the U.S., but it it does have um, a location. It resides in in the deserts of uh, New Mexico, and so on and so on. So here is the total fungal um, um, burden, and um, I think I got the right term. But anyway, it's two. 2,749,159 uh, patients have fungal infections. And the interesting thing is if you look at tuberculosis, there it is, 21. So the rate is quite different, isn't it? And, and so what it points to is that there's a lot of fungal infections. And, and that was the preceding um, study here. As many or more die from invasive fungal infections than drug-resistant tuberculosis, or even malaria, especially uh, childhood malaria, it's much much greater. So, okay. Um, so that's m one country. But what I, I I also put this chart together, and it's a combination of, of data from two different references. And this, um, so what I did was to compare countries as as to again specific data, rates of infection per hundred thousand. So the diseases I've I've mentioned these to you already. But uh, the countries, uh, you can see it's really going to be quite different. So, for example, oral candidiasis, um, which is very common, uh, not so much in this country anymore, but in other parts of the world, um, it's, it, it's very common in HIV, AIDS infections. And so 
769, um, that's the rate per 100,000. Uruguay, 74, so about 10 times higher in, in Kenya. And I can go through these things, and you might figure out what, in fact, or why is, why is this so? Well, it's going to depend upon the specific underlying disease. So if, you, if the patient has HIV AIDS, it's going to be a lot of oral infec infection. So that's part of it. But income is a very big uh, factor in terms of health care. Um, and usually these countries, uh, especially the developing countries, do not have as good facilities in terms of diagnostics, determining what the infection is, and also access to antifungals. But I don't want to go through all of this, but uh, here, here's a, here is, where is it, right here? Streptococcal meningitis, again, HIV, AIDS. And if you look at these ratios, um, it's 162-fold higher in, in Kenya. And again, it's because of the association with HIV AIDS. Um, so I guess that the, the you know, Uruguay is uh, um, you know, a country that is making great progress in healthcare. So you begin to see different kinds of infections. You, you begin to see bloodborne infections and lung infections occurring. And, and what kind of patients? Well, transplants. Um, I'm, Kenya, I'm sure transplants are done rarely. I, I don't have any numbers to prove that, but I would imagine that um, a country with greater wealth is going to be doing that kind of thing. So cancer treatment, um, put it all together, and you, you see that, for example, candidemia is, is much higher in Uruguay versus, versus Kenya. Okay, so enough of uh, that sort of thing, I th but I still think that's important, and it's really good to see more published papers on data from a variety of countries, so you can get a real good picture of how it differs. But that's the important point here. It differs. It differs whether you're living in Kenya versus living in, in Uruguay or United States or so on. And it, it, it bothers me. We, we train medical students. I've been doing that for a lot of years. And we have case presentations um, where they come in and listen. And so they'll, they'll hear about meningitis caused by bacteria. And, and I'm sitting there thinking, wait a minute, what about cryptococcus? You know, that, that causes more than a lot of the bacteria. But in Georgetown University Hospital, they don't see cryptococcus. Why? Because it's under control, pretty much. And that's, that's what you want to happen for all of these countries. And of course, that's not, not possible, at least right now. But um, anyway. Um, so, so this is what we, we work on, and it's polymorphic. That simply means it has a lot of different growth forms. It's part of, the, again, is the normal human microbiota, and it causes skin, mucosal, bloodborne, invasive kinds of infections. Here's, I'm not going to go through this. I think the only thing to mention, I'm not going to go through all these pictures of diseases. I'll flash them through very quickly, but I think the important thing is when you look at risk factors, number one, that's, that's very important for clinical infections of, caused by Canada to occur. There has to be a risk involved. And so obesity, poor hygiene, diabetes, antibiotic treatment, and oral contraceptives. Antibiotic treatment, that's a repeating pattern. You have to think, think of Canada in the gut, okay? It's down there, not by itself. It's there with thousands and hundreds of millions of bacteria. And if the patient is taking an antibiotic, what happens is, of course, the bacterial population decreases, but the fungal population increases, right? Because fungi are not bothered by tetracycline, ampicillin, or anything like that, and so they increase. And when you have that condition, you've changed that equilibrium. And that, that's kind of like basic microbiome study, and we were talking about this 50 years ago. Well, maybe not 50 years ago. But nevertheless, okay. So that's that's one type of Canada. Here is oral. I mentioned HIV. Um, HIV diabetics, broad spectrum antibiotics again, um, and and so I, I want to mention a, one drug, and that's a compound called fluconazole. That was developed in the 1990s. Why? Because everybody that was HIV. AIDS was developing oral candidiasis. 
so the predisposing factor for uh, oral cancer, one of the predisposing factors is HIV AIDS. Um, and so rush, rush, rush. Companies were looking for antifungals and a compound called fluconazole became the number one uh, bestseller, a billion dollar product. And so what happens, however, was that in that population of Canada, in the gut or in the mouth or whatever, there's not just one species. There are many different Canada that are there. And so what that drug was doing was selecting for other Canada species. Why? Because those other Canada species were resistant to fluconazole. Does that make sense? So Canada albicans was not so resistant. But other species of Canada are there also. And so you had a change in leadership. I don't know if that's the right word. You had a change in conditions that allowed other Canada species to take over. Um, and, and it resulted in development of other similar compounds, but you still have some of the same problems. Okay, and vulvovaginal, this, um, um, here is this RVVC I mentioned, predisposing factors again, a number of them. And yet we know so little about immunity to vaginal candidiasis. There's been at least five or six different theories. Why do women, why do some women get one infection and disappears? never again, and others get four per year or more infections, and it's a chronic problem. What's the difference in immunity? We don't know. Okay, uh, staph infections are uh, the leading cause of bloodstream infections in the U.S. BSI is bloodstream infections, and um, so coagulase negative staphylococcus is staphylococcus epidermidis, and coagulase positive staph is Staphylococcus aureus, and there's the total percent of inf bloodstream infections. And the enterococcus is third, and candida species is, is fourth on the list. Now, I would tell you, to make any sense out of this, um, okay, so they're good numbers for BSI perhaps, but again, you're dealing with a number of underlying conditions that are associated with the frequency of staph versus the frequency of candida, and services what unit of the hospital is treating these patients. So you have things like that that can change the numbers. Um, but here's bloodstream infections. This is from a, a 2001 paper. And um, uh, so here's the, so this is the proportion of bloodstream infections uh, and, and, it's accrued more, and accrued mortality. So here's the number of infections, the percent, and here's the uh, mortality crude mortality. So this is a, a, a coagulase negative staphylococcus. That would be staph epidermis. Here's staph aureus. Here's enterococcus. And candida. Look at the mortality that's associated with the candidiasis infection. Even though it's less than the other three bacterial species, the, the fungus it kills quite a few people. Here's, and here's another interesting point here. It, it's kind of a not so complex, but here are the pathogens that cause bloodstream infections. And here is something called the days between admission and onset of bloodstream infection. So the patient comes into the hospital, um, has surgery, uh, or maybe some other condition that requires treatment in the hospital. How soon, if they get infected, how soon did they become infected? So the days between admission and onset and you can see E. coli less, less than two weeks. I'm not going to go through all of these, but you get an idea that not all these organisms are equal in terms of how fast they develop in the hospital. And here's Canada. Canada, you're a bit beyond three weeks of infection. Why? Why would that occur? And what's, what is, what is the, the take home message on that thing? Well, why they occur is because E. coli, Staph aureus, when it's in the blood, the physician gives the blood to the clinical lab and you get a, a diagnosis pretty quickly. It grows from blood, patient blood. And as you go down here, when you get to Canada, you can't find it because it's not growing as well in the blood of bacteria. And I'll give you a, an explanation for that. But you might 
be in that hospital for over three weeks before a diagnosis is made. A little bit of history that may go along with this. So it becomes positive right in three weeks. And the philosophy, even in the 1990s, was, I better get over here, the philosophy, philosophy in the 1990s was, oh, you've recovered Canada from the bloodstream. You better do it again because it's probably a contaminant. Right? It's on your skin, maybe in the IV catheter is in you, and you get an infection. The assumption was it was just a contaminant. Redo the thing. So you redo it, and now you've got another three weeks to wait. And the, so the truth is, that's wrong. You, you never assume Canada and, and all these other organs, you never assume that they're there for the fun of it, that it doesn't mean anything. It's there because they're causing the infection. But that had to change. That philosophy with Canada had to change to show that, in fact, it's an important event if you find the organism in the blood. Okay? Think, one more thing. When we look at this story, think about cost. If you're in the hospital three weeks or more versus less time, it's more expensive. More expensive, right? And so... That, that is a major problem with a lot of these infections, including Canada, is that they're much more difficult to find in the blood. And the second thing is that the longer you stay, the more it's going to cost the insurance company, the hospital is going to pay for some of this, and, and you. And, and that's the way it works. So those are important considerations. Um, then the other thing that will tie into what I just said about um, length of time before a culture becomes positive because many of these pathogens, and I've given you two fungal, Aspergillus fumigatus and Candida, uh, that form biofilms. And I'll, I'm going to show you a picture because the biofilm was, is really a very important part of the whole infectious process. What is a biofilm? It's the three-dimensional community of microorganisms embedded in polysaccharide of the pathogen in those that is attached to surfaces. Um, what is it attached to? Well, it can occur on all medical indwelling devices, catheters, voice boxes, respiratory intubators, things that go in your nasal passage to improve oxygen, replacements, heart, valve, knee, hip, a, a central nervous system, shunts, pacemakers, the whole thing. And so if, if, if the organisms, and we're not talking just about Canada, if the organisms contaminate those things, you have to, the physician has to repeat. Remove the infected knee joint there, uh, product or, and, and redo the whole thing. And um, so how much implantation is there? One, in the US, 1.1 million knee hip devices are implanted per year. Uh, the infection rates of, are about 60% of implanted devices Canada species account for about 20% of those infected devices. The other problem is that, remember I said you got an organism, but it's covered in polysaccharide, and so antibiotics don't penetrate too well. They don't get to the source of the organism, so the, the, the belief is that biofilms contribute to drug resistance. You can have single Canada alone or Canada plus uh, Staphylococcus aureus causing a biofilm. And the biofilm seeds the bloodstream, like an indwelling catheter. So let's look at, the, well, here's the catheter. Uh, and in fact, this was in vitro, but uh, what you're looking at, this is low magnification. So here's the catheter that's been split open, and all this is biofilm. This is in vitro, but to what extent do you see it in vivo? Much less, but it's still important. And here's a higher magnification. Here again is the catheter, and this is all fungus, and, and you can see some filamentous forms and unicellular forms of the organism. So um, what does this have to do with disease? How does it become bloodborne? Oh. Okay, I'm sorry. I'll push it over there. How does it become bloodborne? Well, a couple of different ways. Um, so in this top of the slide here, there's an intestine, and there was intestinal surgery. It, it gets sewn, yeah, 
uh, but sometimes there's leakage, leaky, leakiness to that um, um, suture that's put in there, and the organism escapes, get into the, uh, gets into the perineal cavity, or gets into the bloodstream that way. So here's the organism colonizing the gut. Surgery, if it's not done entirely correctly, that's one of the ways it could get into the blood. But over here, it takes into account these biofilms. So, um, so here we have a catheter, and the catheter is contaminated with candida. And uh, what happens is that it forms a biofilm. And from that biofilm, it can enter the bloodstream. So you've got a catheter with organism growing on the catheter. Um, if they find it, it's fine. Then take it out and do it again. Uh, but, but nevertheless, that's another way it gets from, in this case, the skin. It's on the skin. It gets into the bloodstream. Um, and so what it does, these organisms, once they're in the bloodstream, they visit different sites of the body. Um, so they can go to the kidney, the organism can go to the spleen, to the liver, eye, lung, bone, etc. Remember the point that I made about how long it takes to find it in the bloodstream. And the reason is it, it plays hide and go seek. It's in the bloodstream, but then it goes back into the tissue. Or it, it could be in the liver, and it, in the liver, but then it goes back to the bloodstream, and then back to the liver, or maybe even back to another tissue. But it all started with those biofilms that are formed. And, and, and so you can't find it in the bloodstream, simply because the organism is assuming different sites, and maybe it's not in the bloodstream so long, and so you miss it. And so this is, this is the reason that when cultures become positive, assume that it's an infection. Um, maybe you're thinking, well, maybe beside culturing, what else should they be using uh, to diagnose it? There is a very, very good uh, PCR technique which is available to find Canada under these situations. The problem is the cost. And I've had people from um, Cancer Center in Ohio State University saying they're not willing to pay for the cost of one of these PCR devices. Uh, we're talking maybe 100000 just to do a couple assays. And so probably what's happening is there's a regional lab somewhere that's doing it, everything. And, and maybe it's not happening that way. Okay, I'm picturing a, 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 sort of giving you a gloomy picture here. <laughs> Uh, and and um, NIH has done a wonderful job of really getting money to the scientists uh, to do the work that should be done and really determine what the ramifications are of fungal infections, not just Canada. I just wanted to mention um, one other organism, and this, this is an organism that causes aspergillosis, and here's what it looks like in the soil. And all of these things are spores, and the spores get released, and they grow in the soil, or they get up into the atmosphere, and aerosols then will take them back to the ground. If this is a hospital ward or an outside construction area where air is getting into the hospital, these spores can cause infections also. Um, and, um, and I'm, I'm really just showing this to show you the variety of infections for some of these organisms. So over here, with frequency of aspergillosis, frequency of aspergillosis, and the thing to focus is on is what happens if there is an immune dysfunction. Something is wrong with immunity. Um, or what happens in a healthy person. Or what help happens in a hyperactive person, immune person. And so here you have this really high morbidity, mortality type of aspergillus called acute invasive, 50,000 cases per year, immune dysfunction. Um, and at um, lower frequency, subacute infections, uh, infections but not nearly as bad as the acute invasive infections. And then in the so-called healthy population, this number of cases, and you get fungus aerosols that get into the lung and um, 
what they do is settle into tuberculosis cavities. So patient has tuberculosis, uh, there's a cavity that remains, the fungal spores come into the lung, gets into those cavities and grows within the cavities. Uh, or chronic fibrosing, or some of these, I'm not, I can't really define them for you, locally invasive. But then you look at the other end of the spectrum, hyperimmune activity, allergic sinusitis, severe asthma, um, ABPA, which is allergic bronchial pulmonary aspergillosis and cystic fibrosis patients. So what you have is a completely different picture depending upon the immune status of the patient. I think it's important when you're studying these things to recognize that. Okay, the lab focus um, is on drug targets, antifungal drug targets. I mentioned resistance, I mentioned toxicity, and drug-drug interactions, so that's the why. Why are we doing this and why are many other labs doing it? These are the reasons. Um, and so what we do is, um, remember I told you both people and fungi are eukaryotic, so there's not as much difference between versus bacteria that are prokaryotic. Uh, so um, what you have to find if you're gonna do this, and first, I guess first I should develop a concept of what a target is. The target is the part, in this case, part of the fungus that you're targeting. A membrane of the fungus, the cell wall of the fungus, a, a nucleus of the fungus, whatever you're doing, that would be the target. What does the drug react with? That's called a target. And what you want to find is using bioinformatics is to identify fungal specific targets. Fungal specific. In other words, you're eliminating, you're reducing the possibility that in fact there could be toxicity because the targets are similar, people and fungi. A good example of that is um, our membranes have a sterol called cholesterol. It's part of the membrane. Uh, fungi do not have cholesterol, but they have something called ergosterol. Very similar, and so those compounds that inhibit ergosterol synthesis, the fungal serol, those that inhibit that also can be inhibitory to cholesterol. And so that's, that's what results is, is toxicity. So you, you need to do this kind of thing first. And even, uh, we'll get into some of that later. And, and then what you want to do is, is validate um, the importance of that target to the pathogenesis of candidiasis. A, is it a target that's not really needed for disease? Is it a target that, yes, it is needed for disease? So you have to do that. And this requires a lot of um, molecular biology research. What you have to be able to do is construct, construct single gene mutants of, of this organism. You, you take away one gene of the 6,400 genes that Canada has. You take one away by, by molecular uh, process, and you say, okay, it's missing that gene. What is different about the organism? Is it no longer causing disease in mice? Is it, uh, you know, so that, that's what you're looking for. You're looking for a gene that not only is fungal specific, but also, is important to the disease process. So that's very important. And um, so these mutants are constructed, and you can assay for virulence. Does it kill mice? Does it not kill mice? Changes at the cellular level. Does it change the cell wall? Does it change the cell membrane? Does it change anything you want to look at? Or subcellular level. And we've looked at biochemical properties of these mutants, a protein, gene arrays, RNA sequencing, polysaccharide signal pathways, just to get a really good foundation of what, if that target is important, what is it doing? What is that drug doing? What, where is the target that it's, um, that it's acting against? Okay. Okay. So why are we interested in drugs? Resistance. And um, so what we're showing here is a f fungal cell. And this is a susceptible um, a, a, a cell, a fungus, candida albicans maybe, that's susceptible to a drug. And here's the drug. And it, this is the, the membrane. 
here, and the drug comes into the cell, it binds to its target, which is ergosterol, and the organism is inhibited or even dies. Okay, so that's susceptible cell. Notice in susceptible cells there are these things called efflux pumps, um, and, and one is called MDR and one is called CDR, and so the drug comes in and, the, and gets pumped out. Okay, that, that's, good f that's, that's good for the fungus because the drug's coming in and it gets pumped out. Here's, here's the pathway. Well, we can get into the origin of these pumps. It's kind of an interesting thing, but really no time. But I want to just compare what you see in a susceptible to what you see in a resistant. The first thing you see is that there's many more efflux pumps. This is called overexpression. So this one has two. This one has 10 or 20 different efflux pumps, just to show you. And so the drug in a resistant cell comes in and gets pumped out by these different kinds of resistant pumps. The, but, but there are other ways it becomes resistant. For example, here, here's the target. It's part of that ergosterol synthesis. There's the target. And the differences in the picture is to show you that the resistant cell is more target. It just overproduces target. And so therefore, there's not enough drug. In, in a susceptible cell, you got target and you got drug. In a resistant cell, you got more target, maybe the same amount of drug. So it's proportionally different. And the other thing is that you get point mutations. Somewhere in here it says point mutations. So all of these things are occurring. Um, Here's, here's what I meant about drug-drug interactions. This is true for not just cancer, for any infectious disease, bacteria included. So what I'm showing you here is, here's a liver. And in that liver is an enzyme called CYP3A4. And it stands for cytochrome P450. Uh, and that's because the, the, the cytochrome uh, absorbs light at P450. So it's a liver enzyme. And it's designed to eliminate the drug. So here is a profile. So the patient is on statin. And here is the concentration uh, that's indicated over time. And notice that upon delivery of the drug, statin increases but then decreases over time. That's what's supposed to happen. You can't accumulate because then you get toxicity. OK, right? That's, that's the way it should work. But, but suppose that patient has a fungal infection. Um, so he's now on, or would be on, or she, statin plus azole. So what happens here is that there's competition for that enzyme. It's not just statin, but it's a fungal. Um, it's, a, it's, a, it's a drug which is degraded by the same protein in, in liver. And so what you have in this case, and, and over here it just, it's, it's, it's lower, lower case, it's to indicate this is the, 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 the way it's supposed to be and this is the way it's not and um, because of activity of this particular enzyme. So what the profile you get is something like this. Um, statin, pa the patient's on statin, he, he or she's on azole also, and so the statin concentration increases and so does the azole concentration. And notice that it's not eliminated as rapidly. This is called drug-drug interaction. Both, both of those drugs bind to the same enzyme in liver that leads to their degradation. Now, the physician can find this information very, very quickly. Just go online, statin, don't use azole, it says. The problem, so it's not that. It's not difficult to find drug-drug interactions. What is difficult is, um, I forgot what was difficult. <laughs> um, yeah. Oh, what it's difficult, it, the difficulty is that is that you've lost, there's only three different groups of antifungals, right? Only three different groups. I mentioned that. And so you've eliminated the use of one of those three groups of antifungals because of drug-drug interaction. So now you're down to two groups of antifungals. Okay. All right. And I think that's enough for this. Um, so what you, so to look at the properties of these mutants that you make, you have to uh, use something called reverse genetics. And it's a bit diff more difficult in Canada because it has two genes 
So it's a diploid, every gene is, is duplicated, so it's a diploid organism to win. And so this bar here is, it represents the target gene that you're looking at, and here are the two copies in Canada albicans of that carbon, I'm, I'm sorry, of that, of that target gene. And so what you have to do is make uh, something referred to as cassettes. So here's the five prime end of that gene, here's the three prime end, and in the middle of it is the Canada albicans histidine one gene. And, and so you transform this into a wild type, and that wild type is, it does not have a his, HIS1 gene, and it does not have a, a LU2 gene. So those are oxytrophs for the organism. So what you do then, transform it, and now you've converted one of these alleles to um, that knockout um, structure, that microcassette. And, and, and so, now it becomes his positive. So up here, the parental strain could not grow in the absence of his hist histidine. But in this particular one, now that strain has a histidine gene and can grow. So you can select for histidine resistance. But remember, you have a second allele to target. And so here, it uses the principle of a leucine defect. And so here is that same cassette in which of Canada which you have a candida LU2 gene, and you transform that. And so you've made, therefore, a, a, uh, a mutation in that target gene in both alleles of the target gene. That's what, and it's, it's, a, it's a long and hard process to do, but you have to do it. Um, so, so what you're talking about is, uh, for example, here, percent survival, this is a mouse study uh, I forget, uh, might have been some of our data. So this was a mouse study. This is the percent survival over days. Here is the diploid. This is the wild type strain, and it kills the mice very quickly. It has both copies of that particular gene, both alleles. Here is one that has a single copy. You have to have that control also. And notice that uh, the killing is, or survival, is about half of the, of the wild type. And here is the strain where you've taken out both alleles, deleted both. So you get this nice activity occurring that's gene dosage related. And so this is what you go on to use. And you're so finally, <laughs> getting to the work we do, uh, it was uh, to develop antifungal drug targets. And the two that we worked on, first of all, was the so, something called a histidine kinase. This is a, a, a protein that's found in bacteria and fungi, not mammals. Back to the bioinformatics again, the idea of uh, specificity, fungal only. And the histidine kinases are important in cell sensing and biofilms. And those mutants that I just showed you, how you make them, in a mouse model, in a histidine kinase gene lacking that particular gene, the mutants are avirulent. So you want to see compounds that can inhibit those histidine kinases. Because if you inhibit it, the histidine kinase, uh, the strains, at least in mice, are going to be avirulent. That's, that's a good target. The second set, which we're not going to get to today, was other the same example, but uh, in terms of not found in the human Mitochondria, these are mitochondrial subunit proteins, complex one of the electron transport chain. Again, fungal specific or candida specific, mutants are avirulent, and we're seeking compounds. And uh, we're all hopeful. NIH is going to be happy uh, with, with our work. Um, so here's, I don't want to go through all of this, but just here is a histidine kinase. And this, here is, here is the protein here. It's a very complex protein. And the, the P's that you're looking at are phosphotransfers. So there's an input signal. And it could be in it. It could be carbon dioxide. It could be um, salts, for example. It could be blood. It could be almost anything that um, gets sensed by the organism, sugar sources. And so you get phosphotransfer to um, a second region of that protein and then transfer to another protein, which is called a histone-containing phosphotransfer, and then transfer to a, a third protein. And this is, this is what we worked on 
we've made mutants in this particular protein, mutants in this particular protein, and also in that particular. Now, I think it's important just um, phosphotransfer is common to human cells also, very, very common, just as, and, but, 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 but in, but these phosphotransfers are histidines or they're aspartic acid. Um, and, and those types of phosphorylation do not occur in humans. So the mechanism which is different is the protein itself is different, not found in people, but also the types of phosphorylation, fungi use different amino acids for those phosphotransfers. So you got a couple good things going for you. Um, Compound discovery. Um, this is, I'll go through this fairly rapidly. I don't know, how much time do we have here? Uh, almost done. Almost done? Okay, then I'll skip a lot. <laughs> but, so this is what we've done with uh, Wichita State University um, Department of Chemistry. Bill Gratis um, was the person who would make lots of synthetic compounds. We would go through the process of screening all of these compounds to find ones that were useful. Um, how much time? Ten? Ten minutes? <laughs> okay, so, uh, so here's, this is something, the type of compounds is called a scaffold, and what you do is modify this scaffold. You can use something called stru structure activity relationships. You do MICs, how, how good is the drug, how inhibitory, how fungicidal it is. You can do all of that kind of stuff, and well, we came up with four compounds that are in patent, and uh, one is uh, going on for further evaluation. So I'm going to skip over the screen we use, unfortunately, but we don't have time. It's, it's a screen which is a genetic screen. And what you do, <laughs> it's labor intensive. You got, you use a strain of, of Saccharomyces cerevisiae, not a pathogen, but it's a, very similar to Candida. It has 6,000 genes. You have to make a library of a mutant in each one of those genes. And that's what we have. So we have a library that you can buy, actually, of, of Saccharomyces that are, have a mutation in each gene. Some of those mutations will be a, um, the cause of something called haploinsufficiency. They're not you know, if you if you uh, took Babe Ruth and removed one of his legs, he wouldn't be as good in terms of hitting a home run. It's the same kind of idea. Which of those strains that has a loss of one of the two genes, which one is susceptible to a compound? So out of 6,000 genes, I think we isolated, um, and we could identify 13 genes that were sensitive, much more sensitive to the, the compound than wild type cells. And I don't want to spend a lot of time, um, but the, some are fungal specific, um, some are broadly conserved, which causes problems. Um, and what gets inhibited is something called uh, the kinetochore. So here you recognize this, this is, the blue is, is chromosomes, the green is the spindle fiber, during uh, chromosome separation, and these pink things are these kinetophores. And the kinetophores make sure that the chromosomes bind to the spindle fibers. That's the duty of the kinetochore. And so that's what was being affected by this, one of those compounds that I just mentioned. There was an activity, and that activity clustered in genes that had the same functions. And, and um, and th this is what you use. So yeah, here's 13 hypersensitive mutants. We use something called FunSpec, and that clusters them. Which of those 6,000 mutants is affected by the compound? And are they similar? Are they clustered in some way? And so you do that, and that's, that's what we did. Okay. Um, we also use a repurposed compound library, and um, the, the repurposing means that, uh, in fact, it's in NIH, but other places also, National Cancer Institute. What it is, a library of thousands of compounds that have an activity, but have never been tested against fungi or bacteria. So some might be antidepressants. Some might be anti-cancer compounds that are sitting in that library. 
are they only antidepressants? Are they only anti-cancer? Do they have other activities? And so that's what is referred to as repurposed compounds. And that's, that's been pretty, pretty useful to people. So here's, here's the way I look at the whole thing uh, of drug discovery. It's tough work. <laughs> And here's Calderon and a postdoc where the road to success and you got the speed bump and the speed bump is ROA funding. And it's, it's a tough world out there, folks, let me tell you, but we're trying. And, and so the postdoc is saying to me, wow, that's the biggest speed bump I've ever seen. Okay, enough for the fun. The people that have done the work. Now, real, oh, I don't, we have time to go through these last couple things? No. Okay, let me, um, talk too much. So the first example is decomposition of, of forest litter. And this particular study was done in Chernobyl. And what they did was to look at the importance of microorganisms in decomposition of forest litter. And, and they used various places in and around Chernobyl that had different uh, um, um, dosages in soil. And, and from Chernobyl. Here is the fellow that did the work, and what he has in his hand are sacks of leaves. And the leaves are from a bunch of different um, uh, deciduous trees. And he takes these sacks and he puts them in different sites, um, nylon mesh bags, um, and they are extremely small pores. So he wants to eliminate earthworms getting into those bags. He wants to eliminate any other kinds of vertebrates or invertebrates that are going to get in there and mess around and destroy the data. And so he puts them in bags, the leaves, and uh, their environmental sites were similar in temperature, moisture. The bags were in 52 sites around Chernobyl. There it is. Um, and this is what they found. When they looked at the proportion of decomposition after nine months, at different sites with different background radiation, you can see that <coughs> the proportion of decomposition decreases as the amount of radiation increases. And so I think that's a, that's a really nice paper and hopefully it'll stimulate other things. Here is something which is a little bit worse, um, much worse to define. And this is something that was published, um, some of the data in 2006, but I'll get to a paper, a 2019 paper. Fungal catastrophic infection of amphibians caused by a chytrid fungus. I am not going to even try to, uh, to, to mention that name, um, but there it is. That's the fungus. It's a chytrid, and here is what it looks like. It's unicellular. It produces these things called, uh, here's, here's a, a modal spore, and the modal spore gets bigger and form something called a sporangia, and then those sporangia release more modal spores. So this happens in water, and um, so that, that's the whole cycle of the organism. And here is the data, and this is from a 19, 2019 paper, and what they looked was, was amphibian populations um, in North America, of, of Central America, Europe, um, South America, and so on, Brazil, Africa, and uh, they looked at a number of different species and the color coding indicates severity of decline, 20%, 20 to 90%. I can't read that really. 90%, uh, it's presumed, uh, yeah, well, you can read it, extinct, presumed ex extinct and extinct. And so you look at this, and um, here's, here's uh, they looked at 10 different species of frogs in North America and so on, and you can see the results are amazing in terms of, of what's happened to those amphibian populations. So the summary is a decline of at least 501 amphibian species over the past half century has occurred, including 90 presumed extinctions. Uh, only 12% show signs of recovery, 39% undergoing ongoing, undergoing, ongoing decline. The greatest rec recorded loss of biodiversity is attributed uh, to a disease. And the other thing which um, is, is becoming associated with this is temperature of water. Um, so this is an aquatic fungi. The temperature of water is increasing gr global warming, et cetera, and they think this is part of the thing. So I'll stop. Thank you.
something that occurs in different hospitals. But I was amazed um, that devices that are implanted or implanted knees, et cetera, are not protected from the fungi. Well, how come it happens? I, I'm not quite sure. I thought the sterilization and of the instruments uh, during surgery or you know the catheters and all that uh, they well, do not uh, have the, you know they do not kill the fungi. I say it's a good question. I think there are a lot of factors that are involved in that, um, and and it seems to me that it's it's also a factor of what the organism is. You know, that's one of the things. Um, you, you know, things other things you just don't have that problem. Other organisms, so it's it's a bit complex. Yeah. But for some reason, it likes this. Yeah. Okay. I'll stop there. Yeah. Sorry, the time is actually limited. So you can informally talk to uh, Professor Calderon after this. So please join me. Thank you him again. Oh.